Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Calling is what I can base my decisions on. Calling is what I can allot my time to. Calling is what I can pursue with all my heart. It allows me to say yes to certain things and say no to certain things. It helps me deal with distraction and it brings my life to a point of concentration. As Christians, God calls us to live at peace with each other. Unfortunately, our world is a broken place. Offenses occur, forgiveness is needed, and sin is always lurking. So how do we actually put peace into practice? Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy reads from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, uncovering the principles of peaceful living with his concluding message titled, Peace Rules. If you'd like to catch up with any of these messages, you'll find them online at ktt.org. Here's Philip. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, says, nothing matters more than knowing God's purposes for your life, and nothing can compensate for not knowing them. And that's what we're trying to do in this series, establish the call of God upon our lives and the different facets that make up that call. And here's the seventh aspect of taking the call, called to peace called to peace. Look at verse 15 of Colossians 3. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. One of the major callings on a Christian's life, according to this text in the Sermon on the Mount, is to be a peacemaker. The Christian has come to enjoy peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. The Christian can come to experience the peace of God through prayer and meditation. And having experienced peace with God and pursuing the peace of God, you and I are always, in likeness to Christ, attempt to live at peace with others as much as is practically possible. This text is not about internal peace. This text is about peace in the body of Christ. This text is about interpersonal relationships within the church. That's what Paul's teaching here. And let the peace of God rule, or we'll see in a moment, umpire, or make the decision in your heart. So when you and I are dealing with something in the church, a disagreement or alternatives or possible paths, here's the thing. Always in your mind, you're going to say, in terms of the outcome, what is the best outcome that produces greater peace? That's what Paul's arguing here. To the elect of God, those beloved by God, who are called to live in community with each other and pursue the oneness that Jesus has established in the body. The focus is corporate. That's the principle. Let peace, where possible, be the outcome in every debate, every decision, and every difference. Now, it's not always possible. There is a truth. I would rather be divided by the truth than united by error. This isn't some slavish, idolatrous pursuit of peace. Because in chapter 2, he warns against false teachers. He warns against those who are going to spoil our simplicity in Jesus Christ, and we're told to have nothing to do with them. Paul calls out false teachers all the time. He tells the church to kick them out the door. So where it's possible, let peace be the outcome in every debate, every decision, and every difference. Sometimes it's not. But here's the point. A little statement I think I took from one of the commentators. This passage is not about peace within. It's about peace between. Christ has established it, right? Colossians 1.20, He has made peace through the blood of the cross. We are already united as men in Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are brothers. But the peace that Christ has given us, right? Remember He said to the disciples, my peace I give to you. We already have peace. 
but it's fragile. It's got to be watched over and worked at. That's why Paul will say in another passage in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You've got to work at it. The word endeavor is a word that means work. Pursue. Guys, peace must be protected. We must shed dreamy ideas of church fellowship. Singing kumbaya together won't cut it. Saying, why can't we all get along won't make it happen. The flesh is indwelling. Misunderstanding happens. Forgiveness is hard. Stubborn pride is innate. Old animosities live on. Grace is supernatural, not natural. Bonhoeffer says this. He who loves his dream of community more than the Christian community becomes a destroyer of the community. I remember many years ago at the Shepherds Conference at Grace Community, in the early days of my time in the United States, I ended up at the Shepherds Conference bumping into and befriending a, a young Irishman who I think was living in Australia at the time, but had come to the conference, but he was originally born in the Irish Republic. Now, if you know the politics of Northern Ireland, this is Jew and Gentile. This is barbarian and free. This is the Northern Irishman and the Southern Irishman. But now you are united in Christ. And I invited him home. We had a little apartment in Santa Clarita at the time when I was going through TMS. And we drove into my garage. The door automatically went up. And right on the wall was the British flag. Now, for me, I wasn't an American citizen at the time. So, you know, I just wanted to remind myself of my roots. And, you know, to me, that brought a, a warm feeling to my heart. To him, it's a red rag to a bull. He's an Irish Republican. We pulled in, Union Jack's right in front of him, and he turns to me, and he says, it's as well we're saved, isn't it? Or you and I would be kicking the daylights out of each other. <laughs> That's true, Bill. It's as well we're saved. Can I interpret that theologically? It's as well we're putting off the old man and putting on the new man. We need to clothe ourselves with Christian virtue because the kind of person described here, right? The man who puts on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, and above all love, that guy's not too hard to live with. He's kind of the kind of person that's peaceable. Secondly, not only do we need to clothe ourselves with Christian virtue, we need to practice forgiveness repeatedly. Now, there are some things in our dealing with each other we just need to put up with. Can we develop that skill just suck it up. There's some things just, hey, we're going to agree to differ on that. This isn't such a big deal. It's just, you know, personal preference or, or whatever. Paul tells us to do that. Forbear with one another. Just put up with it. Some of us are like General Oglethorpe, who was a British commander in Georgia in the pre-revolution days, I think. And he was visited by John Wesley, the great Methodist leader and ugly Thorpe was known as a kind of bitter man, harsh man, you know, tough as nails. And one day in a conversation with John Wesley, he said, I never forgive. I've heard men say that, haven't you? Has it ever escaped your lips? I never forgive. Wesley was dead right in his answer then, sir, I hope you never sin. That's the point. Put up with one another but when there's a real offense, put it away through forgiveness because Christ has forgiven you. Thirdly, we need to cultivate a spirit of gratitude. We need to cultivate a spirit of gratitude. Not going to spend a lot of time here, but notice at the end of, of verse 15, be thankful. Look at the end of verse 17, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. An attitude of gratitude contributes to an enjoyment of spiritual tranquility. Because murmuring and grumbling produce inner agitation, okay? Bottom line, it's harder to find grievances when you're looking for things to be grateful for. Gratitude looks for the best in people, not the worst, because everybody's going to have a fault line. But when you attach yourself to that, you're going to miss some other great things. As recipients of God's grace and those who are grateful for it, then we should tend to be more gracious towards others. 
Max Licato has a great little statement I came across in a sermon by my friend Mark Hitchcock. He says this, the grateful heart is like a magnet sweeping over the day and collecting reasons for gratitude. Do you go through the day looking for reasons for gratitude or finding fault so you can gripe? That won't help anybody. That won't produce harmony within your marriage, within your life, and certainly not within the church. Here's another thing. We need to embrace the Word of Christ. We need to embrace the Word of Christ, right? Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Next verse, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. If peace is going to be promoted, if peace is going to prevail, the Word of God must be preached and the Word of God must be practiced because then when the Word of God is preached and practiced, peace is known. What about that verse in Psalm 119, 165? Great peace of they that love thy law. You see, in meditating upon Scripture, we're going to be confronted by a revelation of the God of peace who made peace through the blood of His Son and who offers us an internal peace that passes all understanding. When you're reading that stuff, that's what the Bible's about. It's the story of redemption. It's the gospel. And when you reflect on that aspect of God's character and the work of His Son, Jesus Christ, and you respond to that in an appropriate manner, peacemaking results. When you love the God of peace, when you have peace with Him through His Son, and the Spirit of God is developing a peace that passes all understanding, that promotes peace. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Then peace will dwell in the church richly. Next, we need to speak to each other wisely. Go back to that verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So we're to teach and admonish one another. That's fellowship. That's conversation. That's discipleship. And it's to be governed by wisdom that comes from the Word of God dwelling in us. Wisdom is insight. And so here we have another principle that makes for peace in the church, the need to speak to each other wisely. Do you? Do I? Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And if death is in the power of the tongue, the tongue can kill peace, can murder tranquility within the body of Christ. Angry words, unkind words, unwise words. Throughout the book of Proverbs, you'll get this little phrase repeated, the tail bearer separates friends, divides people. That's why you and I need to speak to each other wisely. We need to know what to say if we're going to say something. And by the way, we also need to know what the other person said through listening. No point saying something to them if you haven't truly heard what they have said. You could be responding wrongly and producing misunderstanding. We need to know what to say. We need to know what the other person said. But we not only need to know what to say, we need to know what not to say. We need to know how to say it. And we need to pick the right time to say it. We need to admonish and teach one another in all wisdom. Communication is hard. I like the story of the Spanish ambassador who came to the United States many, many, many years ago, wasn't altogether fluent in the breadth of the English language, that did a reasonable job, but sometimes got himself in a little mix-up in terms of his P's and Q's. And so he's in a conversation with an American diplomat who asked him about his family and his children. The ambassador was trying to communicate to his American friend that unfortunately his wife couldn't have any children. And so here's what he said, my wife is impregnable. The American said, what? And the reaction from the American made the Spanish ambassador realize he hadn't picked quite the right word. And so he responded, what, what I meant to say is my wife is inconceivable. <laughs> Making things worse confusion reigning. He had one more attempt. He says, what I'm really trying to say is my wife is unbearable. <laughs> Communication's hard. We need to learn to speak to each other wisely. Two thoughts. Bear with me. We'll get it done here in a couple of moments. Just these are the things that make for peace, which must govern and umpire our life in the church. 
Two last things. We need to express joyful worship. Singing songs with grace in the heart to the Lord. That's worship. This is a, a summons to worship. The call to peace involves a summons to worship. Now, my focus here is not the mechanics of worship. You can get drawn into this text, and I've done it before, the form of singing, the choice of songs. Let's ignore that for a moment. The point is this, that worship seems in this context of being called to let peace reign. Worship contributes to peace. Question high, very simple, I think. Worship exalts God, doesn't it? Magnifies Him, puts Him at the center of everything, makes Him large in our thinking. And consequently, worship exalts God and debases man. At the heart of worship is submission, prostration, your will be done. Here's what the conclusion then, in a state of abasement, if you and I are worshiping, singing with our hearts to the Lord, we're in a state of submission, a state of debasement. And when you and I are at that place of humility, and love for God, and marveling at the gospel, it's harder to make things about ourself. It's harder to act proudly. It's harder to seek preeminence. All the things that disturb the life of the church. E. Stanley Jones, who was more of a liberal stripe, by the way, I want to be honest about that, but E. Stanley Jones, the missionary to India, once said this, it's a good word, if you don't surrender to Christ, you'll surrender to chaos. We need to worship and submit and buy. And in that state of joyful worship, peace will be promoted. And so, guys, finishing up, finally, we need in all things to live for the fame and name of Christ. Isn't that where it finishes? And whatever you do, and I think the focus here is life in the church, unity, love between the beloved and the elect of God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's just talked about worship, singing, exalting Christ, and therefore he picks it up because he wants to remind us, hey, worship doesn't take place between 11 and 12 o'clock on a Sunday morning only. It's not just singing. It's anything you do. There's no wall between the sacred and the secular, only in the minds of some, certainly only in the minds of some of a liberal bent within our nation, but biblically, our faith in God is personal, but it's not private. It better show up at Congress. It better show up on the Senate floor where your convictions are biblical and you speak them without embarrassment. You don't check your Christian faith at work, on the university campus, or in the halls of power, the kitchen, the bedroom, the soccer field. Watching television, it's, it's all to be done to the glory of Jesus Christ. Basically, we're not to disgrace His name. That's about it. And if we're governed by that, peace will reign in the church. You know? That's the trouble at Corinth. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Peter. Really? Did Paul save you? Did Peter die for you? Is Apollos the head of the church? There's only one name that the Father will exalt, and that's his son. Remember here in James Kennedy, tell this story and we're finished. A man in the army of Alexander the Great, his own name was Alexander, was brought before the great commander. Because in a moment of cowardice, he turned in the face of the battle, and so he was brought before the commanding officer. He was a young man, fair-looking. And for a moment, Alexander the Great looked at him with some sympathy and understanding. And so he engaged this young man in these words, what is your name? Sheepish, cowering a little bit. The young man replied in a soft voice, Alexander. The great commander replied, I can't hear you. What is your name? With a little louder voice, he said, Alexander. And at this point, the whole temperament and emotion of the moment changed. 
And Alexander the Great responded famously to this other Alexander who had run in the heat of the battle, young man, either change your name or change your conduct. And I think Paul would say that to you and me. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, then live a life worthy of that name which reflects his name. And if you don't change your conduct, then change your name. But I hope that you and I will pursue that Christian conduct, of putting on Christian virtue, of letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, of forgiving one another repeatedly, of, of being grateful more than being a grumbler, and certainly doing it all for the glory of Christ. Father, we thank You for our time this morning. It's good for us to be here, to leave all the noise behind stuff over which we can't fully control. But we thank you. We, we, in a sense, command our own destiny as the church. We can contribute to the, an unshakable kingdom. We can submit ourselves afresh to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We can pursue those things that make for peace in the body because we've got reason to We've got power to do it. We've got a model in the cross and in the Savior, and therefore help us as men who sometimes love to fight. Help us as much as is possible and as much as lies within us to live at peace with all men and especially with the brothers and the sisters of the assembly of the saints. We repent of things that we might do or contribute to conflict. We renew our commitment, not to a dreamy version of Christian fellowship, but a real one, that real fellowship will require patience, forgiveness, habitual pursuing of peace until we are perfectly made in the likeness of Jesus Christ and will live in complete harmony as the family of God forever. Watch over us this day. Bring us to your house tomorrow. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. And today's message is the conclusion to the sermon titled, Peace Rules, from the Take the Call series. When you visit us online at ktt.org, you can hear more broadcasts from this series. You'll also find helpful resources and have the opportunity to become a highly valued ministry partner with us as one of our Truth Ambassadors. We are living in divisive and chaotic times, and the gospel of peace is still waiting to be heard by people all over the world. When you team up with us at Know the Truth as a Truth Ambassador, you become a key part of our ministry by helping us reach these precious people with the gospel. Jesus said, The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. So when you partner with us by giving a monthly gift of $25, $50 or more, you are helping fill a very vital gap in God's great commission. You'll also receive a welcome package and special monthly resources from Philip DeCourcy when you sign up. So, will you join with us today? You can sign up or give a special one-time donation at ktt.org or by calling 888-644-8811. And as a special thank you for your gift of any amount, you'll receive Derek Tidball's timely book titled, Called by God, Exploring Our Identity in Christ, where he addresses the different stages of Christian's walk, starting with our conversion and concluding with our promotion to glory. Be sure to request this outstanding book when you give today. Again, call 888-644-8811 or sign up online at ktt.org. And if you haven't linked up with us on social media, we'd love to hear from you. Just head over to Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter and search for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy and click like or follow. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. So glad to have you with us. Join us tomorrow for another powerful message here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Yeah.